Well, welcome to our study on the book of Daniel. <clears throat> it is a great privilege of mine to be able to teach this course because I recognize its importance. This book is uh, perhaps one of the most important books in the Bible, especially for understanding the end times and the times that we are living in today. Uh, there are great implications for us today from the book of Daniel and it is really the key to understanding the book of Revelation and these other end time books. So uh, Daniel is a tremendous book of utmost importance and so I'm super excited to be studying it with you. Uh, one of the keys to understanding the book of the end times, the book of Revelation, like I said, one of the main uh, themes is the sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of God, that God rules in the affairs of men. He puts up one, he puts down another, he is ultimately in charge. And this gives me great hope for the future, gives me great hope for where we are right now, because the days that we are living, I mean, I don't know how it is in Zambia, but in the United States, there's all kinds of crazy stuff happening right now. And so this book gives me great hope that God, he's still in charge, he's still sitting on the throne, and he knows what he's doing. In Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 10, the prophet Isaiah says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. See, the Lord has declared the end all the way from the beginning. From the beginning of time, He already knows what's going to happen, and He alone has the power to bring it to pass. And this is uh, one of the ways, actually, that God challenges false gods in the book of Isaiah he actually tells him he says why well, you if you're a god then you tell me tell me what's going to happen in the future tell me what happened in the past tell me what will happen in the future and then show me that you have the power to bring it to pass he says this Isaiah 41 essentially says let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen let them show the former things what they be that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare us things for to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are gods. Yea, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed, and behold it all together. You see, only the true and the living God has the ability to declare a thing from the beginning, and then to bring it to pass. So you could divide up <coughs> um, the book into two major outlines here. You could divide it up by saying part A is the historical period going from Nebuchadnezzar to Darius the Mede. That's the first six chapters. And the second part, part B, are visions of the future and Israel's destiny in relation to the Gentile kingdoms and even on into the future, talking about the Antichrist and the tribulation and that stuff. So, good stuff. It's a great book. Just a few random thoughts that I have that I want to share with you as we get started here <clears throat> about Daniel. Daniel was renowned even in his day for being a righteous man. And you see, in even Ezekiel, who was a contemporary of Daniel, Ezekiel says, Ezekiel 14, verse 14, Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. In other words, uh, Ezekiel, uh, by the mouth of the Lord, really, is uh, telling us who the three most righteous men are in the history. Daniel, Noah, and Job, three most righteous men. And let's also see in Ezekiel 28, he was known and renowned for his wisdom, even while he was still alive. I mean, if you think about it, Ezekiel and Daniel were contemporaries, but when Ezekiel prophesies in Ezekiel chapter 28, in verse 3, 
Uh, Daniel was only about 40 years old when this happened, so he was still fairly young. And he was known for his wisdom. Speaking, uh, prophesying about uh, Satan, Ezekiel actually says, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There's no secret that they can hide from thee. So Daniel is recognized for his wisdom, even while he's still fairly young. <clears throat> this book of Daniel, it is both historical and futuristic. So it's, it's prophetic through and through. You're going to find even some parts that seem like they're historical. They also have prophetic implications for the future. So that's important to know too. So we're going to start by giving you a little understanding of where Daniel is in its, in its historical background, where it fits into the history of Israel. So we're going to do just sort of a quick overview. If you remember from your study of the Old Testament, <clears throat> we know that God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. He called, he said, I'm going to give you, I'm going to make you great. I'm going to set you apart from all the other nations. I'm going to make you great. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to give you children as the sand of the sea and as the stars in heaven. And so Abraham left his home and he came to the land of Canaan. But God did not immediately give him the land of Canaan. But it was the promises were going to be fulfilled through his seed. So we know that Abraham, he had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob. And during Jacob's life, Jacob had 12 sons. Jacob, uh, Joseph ends up going to Egypt. Famine comes in the land. The people move to Egypt to be spared and protected during a time of great famine. Now they end up staying in Egypt for about, I believe it was 483 years. They're in Egypt and they're in, while they're in Egypt, they're multiplying and they're growing. They become a great nation of probably between one and two million men. That's my understanding. Then we know God raises up Moses. He delivers them from Egypt. They come out of Egypt. They wander in the wilderness for 40 years. During the time of Jacob, or during the time of Joshua, they're going to enter into the promised land and begin to conquer the, the land. Now, again, another period of almost 400 years is the time of the judges. During the time of the judges, then Samuel is the prophet and the last judge. And during his day, the people desire a king. All right, I'm just giving you a quick little background here so you know where Daniel stands. Now, they make Saul the king. Saul's the king of all of Israel. Because of his disobedience, God then chooses another king named David. And David is from the tribe of Judah. And David then is going to become... God's going to use David to start a line of kings that is going to run all the way to the Messiah. Now, David's son, Solomon, becomes king. Now, because Solomon is disobedient, there's a lot of mixture in his life, he brings an idolatry into the country, God is going to take the kingdom away, at least not, not completely, but he's going to take a good portion of the kingdom away from Solomon, but yet for David's sake, God is going to continue a line from David uh, in Jerusalem. And so the kingdom is divided between the north, which is going to be called Israel, and the south, which is going to be called Judah. In the north, we know that eventually Samaria is going to become the capital, and in the south, Jerusalem remains uh, the capital. Now I'm not going to go through all the north. Okay, the north, for the most part, actually, not even for the most part, every king of the north was wicked. Uh, starting with the very first one, Jeroboam, he brought idolatry in, and it and he started a new priesthood, and they were just wicked from day one. Didn't walk with the Lord. 
And so they're going to be the first, actually, that God brings judgment and takes them away to Assyria in 722 BC. Now, at that time, Assyria is the major power, the major kingdom in the earth, which I will show you a map here uh, in a minute. You'll see that Assyria, here we go, Assyria, if you see this map, actually includes Babylon. Babylon is part of Assyria, and in Isaiah's time, the Assyrian Empire is the major ruling kingdom. So they take Samaria. Here's Samaria. This was the northern part of Israel, and they take the north captive, and there they become part of Assyria. But the southern kingdom now still carries on for another 140 years or so. I'm just being rough. I don't have the exact number. But from 722 B.C. all the way until 586 B.C. before, or 605 B.C. is the first captivity, and 586 Jerusalem is taken. We'll come back to that, but just so you, you get a big picture. Assyria takes the north, and those people are deported all throughout that empire. But the south continues for a while. So the south starts with Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and we know it's going to go, if you look on the right side of your screen, here we have a list of a list of the kings from the south. Rehoboam, Abijam, Asa, Jehoshaphat, etc. All the way down to Zedekiah. Now, if you will see here, I make a little note right here. Jehoiachin, Jeho Jehoiakim, this is the time of Daniel, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, <clears throat> and in this first captivity that happens in 605 BC, Daniel is going to go to captivity. So that's important to know, just so you see the timing here. Ezekiel is going to be taken into captivity during the second captivity, uh, which is going to happen. I don't have the year written right here, but it's after Daniel, just so you have an understanding. So here's Ezekiel, and here's Daniel. They're contemporaries for a time, but Ezekiel goes later in the second captivity. Jeremiah, on the other hand, if you see, he came a little bit before, but he was he was still alive for a time in Daniel's life. But the prophecies of Jeremiah are actually going to inspire Daniel. Later on, we'll see this in the book of Daniel, that Daniel begins praying after the 70 years have, have been fulfilled because Jeremiah prophesied that the captivity would last for 70 years. So they, you here you have a, one great major prophet inspiring another one and reading his prophecies so that he understands you know what's going on so in the south then over here back over on the left hand side we've got Rehoboam Hezekiah Manasseh that's just sort of a big big overview here but if you look here so Hezekiah was a godly king but he has Manasseh. Manasseh is wicked. And Manasseh is going to be the one of the major reasons why the Lord is going to bring judgment to Jerusalem. Which doesn't happen right away. But Manasseh was wicked and he just filled the land with evil. With sin, idolatry, bloodshed. And it was just terrible. But Manasseh actually repents. So the judgment does not come in his day. And he has a son, Ammon, who is also wicked. And so God slays him after only two years of being the king. But then what happens is God raises up a godly king named Josiah. In the days of Josiah, he, he begins reigning. He's about seven years old. In the days of Josiah... They're going to have the greatest revival that Judah had ever known. And God begins to move. And Jeremiah the prophet is a young man. And he begins his ministry during the reign of Josiah. Now unfortunately Josiah dies young. And Josiah, um, his, his children do not walk with him. Jehoahaz is wicked. 
and uh, Jehoiah Chin and Zedekiah are both wicked. Jehoiah Kim, I believe, I forget exactly how this all plays out. So Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim are both sons of Josiah. And Jehoiachin is a son of Josiah. Zedekiah is actually like the brother of Josiah. Sorry, the last, <laughs> the last four kings of Judah are a little bit confusing. So Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim are the sons of Josiah. But Jehoiachin is the son of Jehoiakim. Okay, I hope that makes sense. And then Zedekiah is another son of Josiah. So Josiah actually has three sons that end up being king. Three sons. Jehoahaz. Jehoiakim and Zedekiah are all the sons of Josiah. But Jehoiachin, Jehoiachin was the son of Jehoiakim. So Zedekiah is actually the uncle of Jehoiachin. Okay, hope that makes sense. That's not the point of our, of our study this week, but just so you understand that relationship. So Assyria <clears throat> was going down. And Nineveh ends up falling in 612. So remember, Babylon is actually inside of Assyria. It's part of, part of Assyria. But then Babylon begins to rise up against, against uh, Nineveh and against Assyria. So they become the dominant power in 612 BC. Then Babylon becomes the dominant power. And so during the reign of Jehoiakim, this guy right here in the reign of Jehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, comes against Jerusalem and he takes the first group in 605 B.C. And this 605 B.C., it's an important date in history because this is going to mark the beginning of the 70 years that Jeremiah prophesied about. And 605 B.C. is also the year that Daniel is going to go to Babylon into captivity. And this is where the book of Daniel is going to begin. So Babylon is the dominant power. And Daniel is going to end up uh, outliving the Babylonian Empire and into the Persian Empire, into the reign of Cyrus the Great. So Daniel is going to be on the scene. He's going to be an important figure for many, many years to come. Amen. Super, super awesome book. All right, let's switch to the next slide. So this is the Assyrian Empire that I mentioned to you. Remember, here's Babylon. They begin to grow and become the dominant force, and they attack Nineveh, and they're going to become the dominant power. And this is the Babylonian Empire. So you can see it, it, it encompasses all of what Assyria was. But then it goes even further than that. And it's going to take over Judah and beyond. <clears throat> so now we're going to move into Daniel chapter 1. So that first, you know, 18, 20 minutes here, we've just kind of given you a little bit of an introduction. So you have some background information so you know where we're going. Now, we're going to look now into chapter 1 of the book of Daniel. This is going to be, it's going to tell us plainly the timing, so you can see that what I said is true. Daniel 1, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. <clears throat> and the Lord gave... Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure of the house of his God. So here we go. <clears throat> During the reign of Jehoiakim, we said that was, uh, he was 605 B.C., 
Nebuchadnezzar comes, besieges the city. This is going to mark the beginning of So Shinar is the land. The land of Shinar is another name that we use for Babylon. It's where Babylon is located. And here we have the third year of Jehoiakim. So again, that's about 605 BC. This is going to mark the beginning of the 70 years captivity that's prophesied up by Jeremiah. And again, remember, there were three separate groups taken into captivity. And there was some space between them. And so the first captivity is in 605. The last one, the third one, was in, is not to almost 20 years later, in 586, when Jerusalem falls. And Jeremiah, as you recall, is still there. He's still alive. So Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, they're all contemporaries. Their lives overlap each other. Their ministries overlap. And the reason that God takes Israel, Jerusalem, and Judah into captivity is because of Manasseh specifically, but because the people, they did not walk uprightly with God. And this is an important point to make because a lot of times in Christian circles, especially Pentecostal circles, we are just praying and crying out to God for revival. And I believe God is moving in the world, in the earth, but we are going to see a great harvest, a great revival that's coming. But think back now, because I mentioned to you that during Josiah's reign, they had a great revival. During the ministry of Jeremiah, his, his ministry was birthed in a time of great revival. But the people did not let the revival get into their hearts and change them. You see, revival came, but Jeremiah said, you know, in, in Lamentations, he's mourning. He says, the, the harvest is past, and we are not saved. How sad is that? During the time of revival, this is in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 20. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. So why is this important to us? It's important to us because history repeats itself. We are expecting a great revival to come, a great harvest to come. But we need to let the revival get into our hearts and change us, change our nature, because the judgment of God is coming. It's coming upon my nation because America has not walked with the Lord. Now, I can't speak necessarily for Zambia, but I know that the world in general is going to face great pressure, great judgment, and great tribulation. But when revival comes, revival's coming first. We need to let the revival get into our heart and change us. Israel did not do that. God gave them an opportunity in the days of Josiah. If they would have repented, if they would have cried out to God, God could have, you know, delayed the captivity even further. He told Josiah it wouldn't come in his day. And Josiah ended up dying young, unfortunately, for him and the entire nation. So, that's just a, an important point. Now, another point I want to make here is the vessels of God from the house of God, they were taken to Babylon. That's going to become important, you know, in chapter 5, when Belshazzar actually pulls these vessels out to use them to worship his false god. But another point I want to make is, even though the captivity and the judgment of God came upon an ungodly nation, it also affected the righteous. Daniel is taken into captivity. Ezekiel is taken in the second captivity. These were righteous men, and they were still affected by the judgments of God. And this is important. And this, I hope you guys get this, this message that there is a teaching in the church that, that sort of makes it sound like Christians won't be affected by judgment of God. They won't be affected by the great tribulation. They won't be, but that is actually... That doesn't agree with Scripture. Uh, God chooses to allow some righteous to be protected. Some righteous will even uh, be affected and lose their lives, especially in the end times. Some of the righteous will 
go up to heaven, but some will be here. And you know what? Daniel and Ezekiel were not preserved. Jeremiah had to watch. You know, many of his, of people he knew, many of the people he knew, his family members, just they were killed and murdered in the siege of Jerusalem. Now, his life was spared, but the righteous are also affected. This is why it's so important that we pray and cry out to God for our leadership and what's going on in our nation, because the judgment of God will affect us too. Now, it doesn't mean he can't protect us. He can protect us. He can keep us safe. Um, so those things are all important to understand. Amen. So here's a little overview of the 70 years of captivity uh, that were spoken of by Jeremiah. It begins in 605 BC. This is the third or fourth year of Jehoiakim. That's when Daniel's taken into captivity. The second captivity is going to happen in the first year of Jehoiachin, and that's about 597 BC, <clears throat> and that's when Jehoiachin and Ezekiel are both taken to Babylon. That's 597. Now, 11 years later, during the reign of Zedekiah, 11 years later, Nebuchadnezzar comes and actually destroys Jerusalem. Jerusalem is taken. And that's the third and the final captivity. And Zedekiah is taken, Jerusalem falls. And then, so 539 BC, we're going to have the fall of Babylon to the Medes and Persians. We're going to see that's what happens in Daniel chapter 5. And Darius, the Mede, is going to become the king. And just three years later, Cyrus is going to become the king of the Persian Empire. And that's when he sends out, makes a decree for the rebuilding of the temple. So, from 605 to the time that Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest go to Jerusalem marks the 70 years of captivity. So, Daniel's, or Jeremiah's prophecy comes true, or Jeremiah prophesied of the 70 years of captivity. Amen. All right, back to Daniel chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 3 and 4. The king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So to help you understand what's happening here is, you know, the king Nebuchadnezzar, they captured the Babylonian Empire captured many lands and they sort of made this conglomerate empire of all these different t people types, people groups. Former countries were now all meshed together into this one giant thing. But they were concerned now with how to govern such an expansive empire. I mean, it was a large landmass. So they had to govern all of that. So what they would do is they would take promising young nationals from those those countries that they captured. They would take them, like Daniel. He took him from Jerusalem and brought him to Babylon. But then they would give them an intense training. It was three years, about three years, of intense training. And they would they would try to indoctrinate them, teach them the Babylonian ways, teach them the Babylonian tongue. Uh, teach them, you know, their understanding of the sciences and, you know, all these things. And then they would be used to help to govern the empire. This was a method that was has been employed by many over the, over the generations, over the years, including the Turks and even the British. You know, the British, you know, in so you guys are in Zambia. I'm sure most of you remember Robert Mugabe, right, from Zimbabwe. Well, him and many other African leaders actually were trained in England. They went and did their, they were taken to England and trained. I knew a man in Zambia when I lived in Zambia who he worked for your government. 
And uh, Kenneth Kaunda actually sent him to Cuba, where he was trained, you know, and taught the ways of socialism and communism. And then he was brought back and helped with the government. So this method is employed, um, has been employed for centuries. These men were usually young, like young teenagers, uh, probably about 14 to 17 years old. They were still young enough that they could be molded, their minds could be framed and changed, and so that they could go and be taught and become, basically when they learn the language, they want them to become <laughs> like Babylon. <laughs> they, want to, they, they want them to become like Babylonians by embarking, imbibing the language inside of them. Now it says here that they were part of the king's seed. So this tells us that Daniel was actually probably a member of the royal family from Jerusalem. He was related to Jehoiachin and Zedekiah and these people. He was part of the royal family. It says no blemish. You know, there was a belief in those days that bodily perfection was important. So, you know, they had to look good. They had to be smart. They had to be well favored. They had to have a certain capacity for learning, you know, um, skillful in wisdom, cunning in knowledge, and understanding science. And I want, I think this is important for us to understand too. I know a lot of you, you know, God's called you. That's why you're training to do, you know, that's why you're listening to this class. You're going to Bible school. But sometimes ministers neglect uh, formal training of other kinds, like understanding and science and, and math. and But depending on your calling, depending on what God has planned for your life, you know, that can be important. So we should not neglect even the secular occupation and the secular training that we can receive. I know in my own life, you know what, God has sent me to many schools. I've actually lost count, but since I've gone, since I've been to high school, out of high school, I have gone to many schools, and you know, I'm not bragging, but I'm, I have, I have like two diplomas and two separate bachelor's degrees, two different master's degrees, and I'm trying to get into, you know, a doctorate program, and and God has used my understanding of science and 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 my natural intelligence that God has given me. He, and he's using that for his glory. And in the same way, Daniel and these others, they had these characteristics. And God was going to use that for his glory. So I say all that to say, don't underestimate the power of your secular occupation and your secular training. That God actually will use that uh, to develop you and prepare you for his ministry, right? The ministry that he's called you to. So we like, we often like to separate the two. Either you're a minister or, you know, you have a secular job. But many times that's not true. Daniel worked in government, you know, he's but he was a mighty prophet of God. So he did both. And, you know, I have felt like the Lord has called me to a dual purpose, a dual calling, where it's not only the ministry side, but then there's a secular side too. And the two, they blend and they make you into a chosen vessel that he has for you. So don't neglect that. You know, also there's some nat a natural side to that, you know, for a pastor, you know, you got to pay your bills too, right? So sometimes it's okay to have a secular training that you can use to make a living. Amen. Hope that Hope that makes sense. Hope I'm not offending anyone. I know, you know, we would all love to just make uh, our living off of preaching the gospel, and that's okay. You know what? You're worthy of it. Uh, a, a minister is worthy of his wage. The Bible says that. But not everybody's the same. So keep that in mind. So another thing that did, I told you about learning the, the language. You know, when you learn the language of another country, it can be important, especially as a missionary, um, you go to another country, it can be important to learn the language. It helps you to make a connection with the people you're ministering to, but also it helps you to sort of imbibe the spirit of the people in a good way. Um, 
and helps you to understand them better. You know, when I was in Zambia, I tried to learn as much of the language as I could. I, I could definitely do better, but I, I know even before I came to Zambia, many of you remember I was in Lesotho for a while, for a couple of years, and I actually took language lessons and I learned as much as I could. So it helped me to connect with the Basutu and also the Zambians. Now Zambia, you guys are a little more complicated because there are 73 different local dialects. So I just learned some basics in like, like Mulibwanj, you know, so that I could connect with you. But it can be important. <clears throat> it says here that in verse 5, the king appointed to them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. So they were given a daily provision of meat from the king. Now this is also common uh, for when a king had all these people he was training and preparing for government they were provided for. They were given the food that they need. But it presented a problem for the Jews as it would present a problem for us today because some of those rules still apply to us. And the, and I list them here. The meat, you know, the animals were killed uh, with the blood and it wasn't drained from them. So we all, we know that the Bible commands that we are not to eat the food with the blood. And so as a good Jew, he would not be able to eat that meat without defiling himself. Also, the meat was offered to idols, which again would provide a problem for his for their conscience. Okay? And just to show you that even in the New Testament. You know, sometimes we think that all those Old Testament things are just done away with and we don't have to worry about them anymore. Well, they had the problem in the early church that these uh, teachers were going around telling the new Gentile Christians, not Jews, but Gentile Christians, that in order to be saved, they had to keep the law of Moses. And in Acts chapter 15, uh, Paul and Barnabas and others came to Jerusalem to deal with this issue, to settle it once and for all. What rules from the Old Testament are we required to obey in the New Testament? Well, in Acts chapter 15, they had a big council. They all came together and they discussed quite vehemently the issue. But after praying and seeking the Lord and talking to Paul and Peter and, and James, they all talked and, and, and James felt from the Holy Spirit that the Gentile Christians did not need to be circumcised. They didn't need to keep all these laws. But out of all the Old Testament rituals, now I'm not talking about the Ten Commandments, okay? We're talking about the Old Testament, the formal ceremonial law from the Old Testament. The things like the washing and the eating and the like the, the things that you couldn't eat, the, the, all the things you had to wash and the different ceremonial things you had to do. Out of all those, they said in verse 20, But we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. Okay? So, even in the New Testament, we can't eat stuff that's killed in the blood. We don't want to eat animals that have been, they, they killed them by strangling and they kept the blood in. So when we kill an animal, that's why we drain the blood. And if we are aware that something has been offered to an idol, then we shouldn't eat it. Okay? So these young men, Daniel, and we're going to be introduced to his friends too, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And there they have Jewish names and Babylonian names. But they, here they are, being trained in the king's court. They would have nothing restrained from them that they wanted. They had the world's pleasures at their fingertips. They were away from their parents, presumably. It would have been a great temptation for them. 
to want to partake in the wine and the meat and just, you know what, we're out of our country, we can do whatever we want. But Daniel, it says that Daniel and his friends, they did not want to be defiled with the king's meat. This is in verse 8. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now verse 9 says, God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And Basically, what's going to happen is they're going to agree together that instead of eating the meat, we're going to be fed vegetables for 10 days, a time of testing, a time of trial, and see how we look after the 10 days. After the 10 days, they looked at them, and in verse 15, after the ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. And so, it's interesting here, and Pastor Bailey will bring this out. I think it's in his book, but it was for sure in the class that, that he taught me when I was in Bible school. He mentioned that the important thing is not necessarily what you eat. <laughs> you know, there's all kinds of fad diets out there. You know, you eat Eat pro. You need protein to be strong. You need, you need this. You need enshima. You need, you know, this to to be strong or to be healthy. And there's truth to that. I'm not taking away from that. But the interesting thing is, you know, a cow and a sheep they eat the same thing, don't they? But they're very different. A cow is very strong, and a sheep is very weak. But they both eat the same thing. The difference is the Lord who causes them to be different. And so if you're doing what God wants you to do and you're, what God has asked you to do, and and he, especially in this situation, they did not want to defile themselves. And the only other option was to just eat vegetables, fruits and vegetables. And God used them to make these young people healthy. So the point is just that it's the Lord's blessing on the food that's the key. You know, you could live in a king's palace and you can eat all the best stuff available to you. And you could be fat and unhealthy and end up with diabetes if you're not careful. So the key here was that God was keeping them healthy and strong. And it's it's funny because then... Melzar, the eunuch, is going to take away the portion of the meat from all the others and make them all eat the same thing that Daniel and his his friends are eating. And I guess I feel bad. I feel bad for them because now they had to eat the same thing and they didn't necessarily want to, but that's what happened. That's what happened. So, amen. Verse 17 says, as for these four children, now this is talking about Daniel and his three friends. I had skipped that verse where we were introduced to them. That was in uh, verse 7. Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah, Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. So those are their Babylonian names that we know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Back to verse 17, as for these children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them. And among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. And Daniel, Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. 
So here we have some very important things to understand. That, number one, the knowledge, the skill, the wisdom, and understanding, these things were gifts from God. Okay, you can be, you know, in my country, and I know it's true all over the world, in England, in your country, sometimes the smartest people academically have no faith in God whatsoever. And so in reality, they come to all kinds of strange conclusions about life and believing that man came from apes. And, and in reality, they're foolish. They're foolish. They have man's wisdom, but they don't have God's wisdom. And God's wisdom is so much better. And it is God who can give us the ability. You know, Maybe God has called you to some secular occupation where you need to have, you know, some advanced degree like a PhD. Maybe not. That's okay. But I'm just saying that it is God who gives us the ability to know things. And we see this in Ecclesiastes 2, 26. For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. And this is this is important to uh, this is important to me because you know sometimes you see the rich and the famous, these you know football players or these actors in the movies, they've got all this money. But the one thing that they don't have is happiness and joy. You know, it's, they don't have it. It's like it escapes them. They're divorced and married multiple times, and they can't find joy. And it is God who gives us these things. And the wisdom that we need to accomplish the purposes he has for our lives, it's going to come as we live a righteous life and we seek the Lord and we cry out to God for Wisdom. Remember, Proverbs is all about wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing. God's the one who can give us the ability to learn, even natural things that we need to learn, even the sciences and math and you know anatomy and physiology, all these things. God's the creator. He created those sciences. And any science that tries to remove God from the equation, it's foolishness. And those people are not nearly as intelligent as they think they are. But it also tells us that he's the one who gives joy. And joy, we know from our study of scripture, that joy gives us strength to endure when things are difficult. If we have the joy of the Lord in our lives, that can give us strength. Now, so we see that Nehemiah 8.10 says, The joy of the Lord is your strength. And in Joel chapter 1 and verse 12, joy was taken away from the sons of men because of disobedience. Amen. But the ability to learn is a gift from God. Amen. We also see in these last verses of Daniel chapter 1 that these, these young men were tested by the king. So I don't know exactly how it happened, but he, the king himself must have been brilliant. Nebuchadnezzar must have been a very, very smart, wise human being because he was the one who had to ask them. He had to know what to ask them <laughs> to determine if they were smart. He had to ask them questions to see their abilities, to see if they understood. So we can't lose sight of that. Nebuchadnezzar was very smart. He was brilliant. But these young men were found to be ten times better than all the rest. And the key on their life was the blessing of the Lord. Amen. The blessing of the Lord. Ten times better than all the rest. And Daniel's ministry is going to continue all the way until the first year of Cyrus, which we're going to get into the prophecies and things that Daniel's going to have. Uh, but he foresaw the the kingdom changing from Babylon to the Medes and the Persians. But uh, that's the first chapter of Daniel. It's really sort of his preparation for his ministry, his secular preparation. We don't want to lose sight of the fact that God can use that. He's going to use our secular preparation 
uh, to prepare us for his ministry. And he's going to give us the wisdom and the knowledge that we need to, to do well and to be smart and to be wise and to come into all those things. So maybe God's going to send you to, you know, the University of Zambia or for some advanced degree or something in a secular realm, but that's okay. Give yourself fully to that, but stay faithful to the Lord, and he's going to use that as you go. Amen. God bless you. Uh, we'll come back uh, next time and look at chapter 2.